All right, and we are live. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for waiting. So I thought it'd be fun today. Uh, and this is actually something we wanted to do last Christmas, but uh, didn't get to it. But uh, basically, in the in the Christmas spirit, um, today we're going to talk about, see if this sounds familiar, a photo period plant that uh, grows to a lot of times 12 feet tall-ish. Uh, they're wild uh, varietals and, uh, and cultivated varietals. Does that sound familiar? Today we're talking about the poinsettia, uh, the journey from gangly Mexican shrub to Christmas icon. And here to drop some knowledge on us uh, is Jim Faust, who's, uh, you're in South Carolina? Yes. At Clemson? Yep. Amazing. And uh, you, you want to just give a quick background on uh, what you spend your days focused on? Yeah, so I'm a, a, a researcher and teacher in, in the field of floriculture. Uh, so I work with um, uh, cut flower producers, potted plant, bedding plant producers. And then uh, since uh, industrial hemp has become legalized in South Carolina, um, we have started to uh, do some cannabis related projects on campus also um, because it's, it's, uh, cannabis is awfully similar uh, the production is awfully similar to many of the plants that we uh, grow as ornamentals. And, and I'll uh, share with you some of the similarities between uh, poinsettia and cannabis that are kind of uh, uh, kind of remarkable how similar the production methods really are. Sure, go for it. Do, do, do you want to touch on some of those and then get into the presentation? or we Sure, sure. We're going to go we there want. first. Sure. Yep. Or, so, or wherever you want. Yeah, this is good. So some of the similarities. Um, uh, the scheduling is almost identical. Uh, so I tell my students, if you can grow a poinsettia, you can grow a, a good cannabis plant. Um, and, and so some of the similarities are that they are obligate short day plants. That, that means that we have a vegetative phase by um, when we have the plants under long days or 18 hour day um, and a six hour night. Uh, and, and then when we want them to flower, we go to short days and uh, and then we can Im immediately trigger flowering to start to occur. So um, the, the the scheduling in that way is identical. The mechanism for f initiating flowers is identical. Um, the plants start from cuttings, so you have to grow. In my world, we call them stock plants, but this is, or, or mother plants. Um, and so we we grow our mother plants. We harvest cuttings. Uh, those cuttings are. Um, propagated for and poinsettia, it's three to four weeks, so it's a little bit slower than cannabis, but similar. Uh, and then we transplant those rooted cuttings, um, and we keep them under long days uh, for one to four weeks, um, depending on how big a plant we want to grow, just like in cannabis. And then uh, when the plant is a size that we like it, we, we, we pinch it, we let the lateral shoots start to develop, and and then we put them under short days, so we you know switch them to a, a, a twelve hour photo period. Or in nature, that naturally occurs in the fall. Uh, usually around the third week of September is when a poinsettia will initiate flowers, and and then it takes eight to nine weeks to when you can harvest them, and that that puts the the harvest of poinsettias into middle to late November, which is when the market is. So those schedules look pretty familiar um, to uh, cannabis growers, I would imagine. So if we, uh, today I'm going to then, you know, talk about um, the history of the poinsettia. And, and to me, it really is one of the most fascinating stories in the plant world. Um, and most people have never heard the story. And I guess that's why I'm here today telling you. Um, and all plants have pretty interesting stories of how they've gone from a wild type um, to a domesticated plant that has real market potential um, and has real value as a medicinal or an edible or an ornamental. And so every plant has an interesting story, but the poinsettias is just, ah, it's a remarkable story. Um, and so we'll, we'll share that with you today because we've gone, we go from, this is a wild poinsettia that I have collected in Mexico and um, brought to the U.S. and um, uh, flowered it. 
and, and so you can see what it looks like. And then, of course, this is our modern day poinsettia. Um, so over really a 200 year history, um, these, these things have been uh, transformed into a, uh, um, a, 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 a Christmas flower. And it's not only just changing the plant to make it look different, look more commercial, or, um, but it's, it's also um, uh, the marketing of it was, was significant to attach it to Christmas because it obviously when it came to this country it had no attachment to Christmas so um, so it's not just the how the plant grows but how uh, the plant has been marketed to become the Christmas flower so that's why I'll tell you that story today um, but before we we get started we'll uh, just a few definition of terms uh, in point the poinsettia world we call the red leaves bracts they're modified leaves that have turned red and so that's the showy part of the the inflorescence um, the true flowers are in the center here and so if we zoom in on those um, these are male flowers you can see pollen being born um, and then these are nectar glands that attract uh, pollinators and uh, you can taste them they are quite delicious uh, they taste much like honey and and then these are the female flowers that you don't often see on the poinsettia that you would buy at the store uh, they usually emerge a little bit later and if you buy a plant at the store take it home you have it in a low light environment and often there's not enough light for the female flowers to actually develop so if you have it outdoors uh, in the higher light conditions you will see female flowers they pop out of the middle of this this is a cyathium uh, the cluster of them are called cyathea and then this is the female flower and and then if you if that flower gets pollinated uh if the plant produces three each pod will produce three pea-sized seeds that actually get physically expelled from the the seed head uh when the when the seed is ripened so it shoots it out a, a couple meters um to then fall on the soil and germinate and grow so as you are probably aware the poinsettia is native to Mexico. The the green the red dots here show you uh, places where it has been collected uh, in in uh, over the past few decades. Uh, and actually, down into Guatemala, you'll find uh, some. Although it can be pretty hard to find in Guatemala, it's been my experience. Uh, but on this west coast, along the the spine of the, the Sierra Madre, uh, you have the poinsettias growing in these highland areas. Uh, and specifically just south of Mexico City is where the heart of the poinsettia is from. Um, and this is where Joel Poinsettia is said to have collected the first poinsettia and shipped it to the United States in 1828. So for, for me, I have worked with poinsettia growers and, and um, I was at a grower last week that does 4 million poinsettias. So it's large scale production, really interesting, I think. Um, and, but we, I've never seen a wild poinsettia. So uh, several years ago, we made arrangements with a Mexican scientist to, uh, that he said he would be willing to show us some plants in the wild. And so we flew into this little strip on the Pacific coast in a town near Manzanilla. And, and then we traveled up into the mountains. So you can see it's back up into these mountains here in the distance is where uh, the poinsettia resides in nature. And so we hike in, um, park along the road, and the first Wait, thing is hold on. To... I, I I want you to tell the part of the story because uh, we're actually going to bring on the producer of Narcos soon. So so tell me the question that your uh, tour guide asked you. Um. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What's going to? He. I, I did skip that. Um. So. So the this this guy's a, a plant scientist. He's actually an American guy who's married a, a Mexican woman, and so he he teaches at a Mexican university. And he's a bot. He's a botanist, and so he meets us at the airport. I've never met this guy before, and uh, and 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 we're walking out out of the parking lot of this real little rural airport, and going to his old you know beat up '70s hippie van, and the first thing he asked me, he says. Uh, so how risk averse are you? <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, we've, we've been planning this trip for, you know, actually it took a couple of years to pull it off and uh, we've come a long way. 
and um, I'm, I'm willing to take a few chances. And he said, well, uh, the thing is that you need to be aware of is that where I'm going to take you today is he put up his hands and he said, it's, it's right between where two drug cartels um, uh, operate. And so he thinks it's, you know, probably a safer place to go, but, you know, you just, we're not going to spend a lot of time out here. So my idea of this trip was to go, you know, traipsing out into the, the beautiful Mexican forest and, you know, see these lovely plants. And his view was, we're going to get out of the car, go into this canyon, take some pictures and get the hell out of there <laughs> really fast before anybody sees us. And, uh, and so we actually end up spending about four hours in there. Um, but uh, it, yeah, it was, uh, he was, he was a little concerned about uh, uh, what we might stumble across, I suppose. Um, so we hike into this ravine and, and, and what you first start to see is these plants up on the, on the hillsides. And, uh, and, 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 you know, they're quite beautiful. I uh, come in here. This is my wife and I, um, the plants are weak stemmed or kind of on the, the walls of this ravine. And then they kind of fall over into the ravine. And, and what I actually wanted you to see, you can, you see these ones in the foreground, but if you look back up way up into here, there's a whole bunch of them, you know, there's 20, 30 picture poinsettias in that slide. Um, but most of them are, um, fairly gangly, uh, lanky stems, single stems. Uh, the bracts are not real big, but it was a beautiful location. Um, again, this is one that's on the, on the floor of the, 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 the river uh, at the base of the ravine. So it grew straight up. And, you know, so that's, you know, 12 feet tall with a single flower at the top. You know, not what you think of when you uh, picture a Christmas poinsettia. And, and then this is a close-up of, of a, a young one, and you can see the bracts are relatively small. This is an absolutely gorgeous plant, um, and uh, yeah, but, but not what you picture uh, today. And so, you know, to appreciate, we, you know, we weren't really the first people to appreciate poinsettias. Uh, the Aztecs uh, cultivated them uh, for their beauty and for their medicinal value. Um, so the, the name in the local language is, the language is Nahuatl, and, and they call the poinsettia the Quetla Xochitl. Xochitl means flower. Quetla has different translations. Um, but it was used medicinally to encourage uh, milk flow in nursing mothers, uh, as this picture shows. And, and, and of course, at that time, often, you know, people would associate, um, a plant's potential value with you know some of its physical characteristics and so it kind of makes sense that you might think that this might help uh with nursing mothers because you have this milky latexy sap um that flows from the broken stems um so uh, so they used it um medicinally and and cultivated it um and uh We'll get back to that in a little bit. So even today, uh, the in the local uh, a, a small uh, city uh, south of Mexico City that, called Taxco, uh, it's a silver mining town, um, and they still in the in the in the square out in front of the main church in the in the city, uh, they have a display and they have a festival of the Cuatla Sochil. Um, and they march the the plant up through the city streets and take it into the the, the church and put it on the altar and kind of celebrate it. Taxco is the city that Poinsett is. The legend is that that is where he collected the plant uh, to, before he sent it to the United States. So there are Mexican scientists today that are uh going around the country trying to uh ex save the germplasm uh, you know what is genetically still available in the country uh, so that the so that we don't lose um all the genetic potential of the plant and so they're going around collecting um specimens in uh, in many locations and this is just a picture that they shared with me to show you the variation in appearances of plants that they have collected uh across mexico today so um, so if we go back to the kind of start our part of the story in the late 1700s, so the Spanish were uh, starting to um, 
you know, travel and explore in, in Mexico. And, and one of those expedition groups uh, was documenting the botany and, uh, and the, the flora and the fauna of the area. And so they had artists with them and they would collect herbarium specimens. Um, so they'd take plant material, dry it, and then send these specimens back to Europe for you know, the academic botanists to begin to give these things names in the Linnaean system. So you give it a genus and species name. And so this is the first um, uh, drawing painting that we have of the poinsettia. And it now actually resides in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania of all places uh, at a botanical library. And, um, and so this, this was around 1788 and it's a beautiful picture. Um, and, uh, and, and the name that they gave it at that time was Euphorbia, um, which is the name we still hold today for, as the genus name, and Fastuosa. Fastuosa means proud. Uh, so it's the proud euphorb. Most of the euphorbs are not very pretty plants. Um, so this was one that was a showier one. And so it got a, a bigger name. This is an example of the herbarium specimens that were uh, actually collected in the, uh, this one in the, uh, in the 1810s, um, uh, sent to Europe, identified. Um, so it's kind of cool to see those still actually existing, uh, the original specimens that have been harvested by the earlier explorers and botanists. Um, so we move up to the 1820s. And uh, as you can see, you know, Texas is, is actually a part of Mexico at this time. And, uh, and they, um, Mexico de declared independence in 1821, and the U.S. needed to send somebody kind of on a spy expedition to Mexico to kind of see what was happening in the country. And the you know, U.S. was interested in acquiring more land here from the, the Mexicans. And so they sent a guy down there who had a, a lot of experience with international travel and was good with languages. And the guy that they chose to send was a, a, a gentleman named Joel Poinsett. And Joel Poinsett is a, actually is still a fairly big name in uh, South Carolina these days. Um, there are a lot of things named after him. He was a, a local politician um, that then you know, uh, moved up from the state legislature to Washington, D.C. and became a, you know, kind of known nationally quite well. And, um, and he, so he was a statesman, uh, a politician. And but he was a hobbyist uh, plant lover. And wait, and, actually, and, can, can you? Because I think his background is he's like James Bond. Can you talk about where else he spent? He logged significant time. Sure. In his life sure. pre pre Mexico. Sure. So, um, so he was actually like a third, fourth generation American. He was a French Huguenot family that had you know left Europe uh to flee for because of religious persecution and and so uh during the independence his family the 1770s uh his family sent him um he's a young child sent him back to England to be schooled so he was actually schooled in England and then uh after the things kind of settled down after the the revolutionary war his family came back to the Charleston area uh, his father was a doctor, and he had been sent to school to be a doctor, and he he left after a year. Uh, and then they went to school to be a, a lawyer, and he left after a year. And he had this kind of wanderlust, as many um, youth would still do today. He wanted to see the world, and he didn't want to be tied down to a, a business. And so he took off actually his his parents died uh he had a good bit of money and he got on a ship and went to europe and so he hung out with uh the bonapartes in in france um and he was just you know just uh i guess like a hippie backpacker sort of guy um and and he went to uh russia and got was well known with the the czar's family and they asked him to stay um, because he was, uh, they enjoyed his company, and he obviously was good at languages to be able to do this. Uh, he he went to he met the uh, I think it was in Iran. He uh, he uh, met one of the like a, a leader there, and and they had never even heard of the United States at that point because this was the eighteen um, teens, and so the country wasn't that old, and so 
word of this country had not gotten to Iran yet. So he, when he met the leader, he, he explained to them this, what this new country was. And, uh, and then the, the U.S. government, because he was good and well-versed um, traveler, um, he had never been an employee of the government, but they basically hired him to go to Chile um, to, to be a diplomat. And so he goes down to South America and he, um, he really f fails miserably as a diplomat. Um, he gets in what, you know, you think of a diplomat as being diplomatic and really, he, he really was passionate about the American model of government and, and really felt the, the, the new world countries and leaders really needed to separate themselves from their colonialist past and, and, you know, really set up an independent Republic and not be um, tied to either Britain or Spain and or Portugal. And so he's, uh, he actively got involved in the, the local politics, supporting um, political leaders that were uh, more likely to set up an American type of style of government. And of course, this was not well received. And he ended up having to flee uh, in the middle of the night out of uh, Chile when the leaders that he was working with got kind of... Uh, uh, thrown out. And so he had to uh, go across South America over to Brazil, uh, get on a, a shipping boat to get out of the, get off the continent. He gets on this boat. Um, it ends up going over to um, Madeira and uh, off the coast of um, Spain. And, uh, and while he's on this trip, he's actually taking horticultural notes, which is interesting. He's actually he has notes where he's um, describing the the wine production in Madeira because um, his idea was that these plants have this great economic value that can that can really push the the American uh, ec economy forward. And so if we could bring you know wine production out of Madeira and bring it to South Carolina, the farmers there are going to do better. So he's taking notes on his way home. He eventually comes back to the states. Um, and, and then in 1822, um, he gets chosen to, um, uh, and he actually traveled in the U S a good bit. Um, and he got elected as a, uh, a politician in South Carolina. Um, and in 1822, uh, the U S government asked the president, asked him if he would go to Mexico and, uh, explore and uh, kind of be a spy, um, the countryside and, and document what he sees. So he's kind of this travel writer guy. Um, and the, he wrote a book and I'll show you in a few minutes, the book. And it's, it's really a, a decent read. You know, he, he taught, it's a diary of his trip and, and reporting about the people and, 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 and the crops and the animals and the lifestyle of the Mexicans at that point. And, um, and you know he 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 was a bit harsh on he did not care too much for the Catholic Church he did not care too much for the Mexican government and uh, and this ended up plaguing his life as a diplomat in Mexico, um, which we'll uh, talk about in a second here. So the point is that he's not a botanist uh, he's not a horticulturist he's a hobbyist he, hob plant lover for sure I, I call him a horticulturist perhaps but on a hobby level he's he's a he's he's a politician and a statesman. And, and so, and part of why I'm telling you this is because he's not, you know, we think of a botanist, a plant explorer. These are just people that like plants. They don't care what the hell the, the commercial value of the plant is. It's just, they go out into the woods and find something that they hadn't seen before. And that's really cool. That wasn't poinsett. He was looking for plants that uh, had real economic value. That, that was his, his thing. So, he kind of sets up this this uh, system where he is has people collecting plants in Mexico while he's there and sending them to the United States. And he's also having people in the States send him plants from the States to Mexico to see what, you know, he was not just trying to steal stuff. He was trying to, you know, let's see where... You know, if we can learn where these plants grow best, maybe we can take something that, you know, we didn't know had some economic value and make something out of it. And so this is a list of uh, one collection that of plants that was sent from Poinsett 
while he was so initially I, I may have got a little this confused he went down as a spy in 22 and then he went back down in 24 uh, that, as that's a diplomat. 1822 and 1824. Oh, yeah, sure. 18, 1820. And so he went back down as then as the actual first American diplomat to the to the to Mexico. So, you know, this is the first time an American representative is actually in there, uh, not as a spy, just as as here. You know, he, here's the statesman, Joel points at, let's, you know, establish um, business opportunities and let's, uh, you know, government, co you know, connections, do what diplomats do. But while he's there, he, you know, does other things. And one of them is he has these nurserymen and, and some of them, he also had people that were like um, in the mining world. They're, they're interested in mining, collecting silver out of Mexico and, and, He's like, okay, you're coming here to, for mining purposes, great, but bring some plants while you're there, while you're coming. And then he'd load them up with plants to send them back to to uh, Philadelphia and New York. And so this is this is a, a list of one particular shipment. And these shipments, there were it wasn't there were multiple shipments. And and so this is an example of where they've numbered the plants that they've collected. And if you start looking at the list, what you'll see are these are plants that one would collect out of the market not not in the wild for the most part you see you know yellow beans nectarines sweet pumpkins 26 is a variety of seeds uh cherimoyas uh some of these are ornamentals um there's uh critigus which is hawthorn uh there's uh alligator pear is avocado uh, there's actually rice from china on this list um there is um what else does it have um castor beans musk melons miraculous wheat um mexican pumpkins so these are the things here's a very handsome tree <laughs> with red berries um so that it was you know a hobby type of thing to do but um it certainly was not part of his day job um but they so they did this and and then, and so this is happening, and and but the, the to me this is a, a great you know we think of politics. It's a great story because we think of politics as being terrible today, and I think politics has always probably been terrible. Um, and this is just another example here, um, and 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 this is how the plant really gets point. The poinsettia gets poinsett's name is because of this political story, and that is John Quincy Adams is the president, and so. Poinsett is working for Adams. Poinsett is, he did the same thing in Mexico that he did in Chile. He, he, uh, he got involved with the, the politics at a level where he took sides with the local politics. And that just did not go well. Um, so in the newspapers in Mexico City, you know, he's getting lambasted and saying, you know, send Poinsett home. We don't want this guy here anymore. And so Poinsett in 1827, he writes a letter to Adams and he says, "Okay, I think uh, you know my time is up here. This isn't going so well. Can I? I want to resign." And Adams, I guess he probably sits back in his chair and thinks about this and thinks, "Well, maybe this isn't such a good idea that you resign because Andrew Jackson was going to run for president against Adams the next year, which is 1828, and Jackson." is from Tennessee, Poinsett's from South Carolina. They're buddies. They, 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 they're close political allies. And in the previous election, 1824, the election actually went to the House of Representatives to make, it was, the elections were different then. It wasn't just like one man, one vote. Um, it was, the elections actually went to the House of Representatives to make the final decision on who got to be president. And, and so Adams was concerned that this would happen again in 1828. And Poinsett had some influence in the House of Representatives. He had been in the House before. And he thought, Adams thought, if Poinsett comes back now, he's going to be influential in the House and he's going to help Jackson get elected over, over me getting a second term. And, and so Adams writes back to Poinsett, no, nah, why don't you just stay there a little while longer? And and wait basically wait till after the election's over and then you can come home, and so Poinsett is stuck in Mexico, 
you know, he no longer is effective as a diplomat. The Mexicans don't want to deal with him. He has nothing else to do but send plans to the states. And it happens to be during this last year of after he wanted to come home and was denied is when he actually sent the poinsettia to Philadelphia. And so if he had come home when he really wanted to come home, the plant would not have his name and we would have forgotten him in the history books for the most part now. So politics uh, was dirty then too, I guess you could say. So, and then, you know, Poinsett, I just love this quote. It's he, 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 when he, in the 1830s, he comes back and he speaks to the Horticulture Society of uh, Charleston and, and, he, and he exhorts them to introduce into our country new fruits and vegetables or useful and useful plants or ornamental plants. Let every member of in this organization whom business or the pursuit of health or pleasure leads to f travel in foreign lands, bring back with him seeds and plants not hitherto cultivated there. If one of these succeeds, just one, he will be rewarded with the consciousness of having conferred a lasting benefit upon his country. And of course, this is this is Poinsett. This is why we remember his name is because he he sent a lot of plants, but there was one special plant that he was giving credit for being the first person to have sent a live plant out of Mexico. People had collected herbarium specimens decades before Poinsett, but what a good's a herbarium specimen. You got to send a live plant if it's going to have some commercial value. You can't grow a herbarium specimen. So this is what Poinsett did. Unfortunately, the other thing that he's known for is, is what is for, still today referred to as Poinsettismo, which is to meddle in another's affairs. And so this term you will see used in Mexican politics and, and uh, because he was not particularly well regarded and he has been remembered in Mexico as a bit of a villain. And so I mentioned that he had written one book in 1822 uh, about his travels before he was a diplomat. And this book is titled um, Notes on Mexico, which is a bland title, but it's an interesting book. Well, what is really interesting, I have found a Spanish version of this book. And the, Sp <laughs> the Spanish version is entitled Teodio Mexico, which translated means I hate you, Mexico. <laughs> so this was their, their interpretation of of uh, Joel points out, he was pretty harsh. He was critical about, about some of the people that he visited. Um, uh, so it's not 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 all that appreciated. Uh, even today, uh, you know, it's like you know, the Mexicans often feel that uh, you know Poinsett stole their plant. The U.S. has made a lot of money off of this, and we've never gotten a dime. Um, that attitude still exists for sure. Yeah, and just quickly, that his name, uh, you touched on it, but uh, like when someone calls someone else, uh, can you say it? Poinsettismo? Yeah, like, like yeah. Uh, I, I just think that's funny. So, so in the, in the chat, there are people from Mexico, so it's, uh, oh. <laughs> you, you, okay. you are touching on the fact that the, the American version of a lot of this stuff is different than probably the... Aztec, Mexican, uh, yeah. you know, his, historical uh, documentation of kind of how things went down. Yep. And, and I'm not going to tell this story or I don't have it in the, the slide set, but, you know, the, it happened again in the 1990s. An American professor um, went to Mexico on a uh, actually just a botanical, on a botanical expedition documenting euphorbias. And and so she was just kind of attached to it. She wasn't. She was a horticulturist, and she stole a plant called Euphorbia cornastra. And Euphorbia cornastra is a very rare Euphorbia in in uh, in Mexico. It's there's only a couple locations in the whole country where it still exists, and it's called the the dogwood poinsettia. And um, it's called the dogwood poinsettia because it has white bracts and like the dogwood flower and she uh, brought it back and and gave it to a breeder in the states and and since it that plant is closely related to the poinsettia uh, the breeder was able to um, uh, cross pollinate them and through uh, they, they don't actually do that very easily but she was able to figure out how to do it and um, and produced a hybrid and that we call them euphorbia hybrids and if you go into the stores today, um, 
uh, you will see hybrid euphorbias being sold that are relatively new to the market. Really, just the last five years uh, have these been introduced. Um, they're all, they, they, we call them euphorbia hybrids because the the growers don't. You know, there's a limit to how many poinsettias you can sell because poinsettia is so attached to Christmas. But if we call this thing a euphorbia, maybe we can sell it some different times of the year. And 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 they're actually quite beautiful plants. Um, very s much smaller bracts, look a little bit more like the wild type. And where you see them in the stores um, mostly is in, in the month of October. Um, there's some very hot pink varieties of these hybrid euphorbias. And... Um, and so they're sold in conjunction with uh, Susan Komen Breast Cancer Awareness Month of October. So you saw them sold uh, in, in grocery stores around, and at least around here, you see them in October before really it's uh, poinsettia Christmas season. So that's another example. And so when I went to Mexico, the, you know, the guy that I met, the scientist out there, he was kind of skeptical at first that I was coming to steal plants because he said, I've gotten a lot of people call me and said they want to see wild poinsettias. And I've always said no, um, because they were people that were wanting to come to take something to commercialize. And uh, and he said, you know, as long as you're coming to just appreciate the plant and not steal it again, <laughs> um, you know, I'll, I'll show you where they are. So um, so we haven't commercialized anything, um, but it's so it's still an issue. Um, in fact, he used the term bioterrorism to uh, describe uh, this uh, propensity for uh, American horticulturists to steal Mexican plants. All right, so getting back on this story, we have uh, the, the plant that Poinsett sent went to Bartram Botanical Garden, which you may know of as in, still in Philadelphia today. Um, the Bartrams are kind of famous Americans, uh, John and William, uh, kind of pioneers of natural history and botany. Um, they built a business uh, in the 1700s starting um, that was collecting new world plants and selling them to wealthy Europeans because the Europeans had beautiful gardens. They had a palette of plants from Europe and Asia, but they didn't have very many plants from the new world. And so the Bartrams would go collect specimens from across North America uh, and, and Mexico. And, uh, um, and 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 sell them and they would transport them in what were called Bartram's boxes and they would pack these things full of seeds and cuttings and 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 that their family made a living for three generations and so by the time Poinsett had sent the, a plant to their they call it Bartram Botanic Garden but in that day a botanic garden was what we would think of as a nursery or a garden center today um, it's not uh, just a place you collect plants it, you may be collecting them, but you're collecting them for the purpose of selling them again. So it's a commercial enterprise, not simply a, a public garden. And so they produce plant catalogs to sell their plants. And this is an example of the last one that they ever produced it was in the 1830 something. And, um, and it's for fruits and ornamentals, trees and shrubs, greenhouse plants. And they would list hundreds of plants and even something like geranium, popular flowering plant, they would have dozens of different varieties or strains. And so you could see on this list, there's some familiar things, fuchsias and gardenias and ficus. We look in here, there's euphorbia. I'll zoom in here. Euphorbia poinsettiae, the splendid scarlet euphorbia. Uh, they were selling for two bucks a plant uh, in the 1830s. And, and which is kind of remarkable because recently Lowe's had a Black Friday sale where we have 99 cent poinsettias. Um, uh, so we haven't really done so well on getting a better price for them these days. So 1828 is when the, the plant comes to Philadelphia Barcham's Garden. It kind of exploded in popularity. Plants went to Europe. Um, the first botanical drawing uh, in Europe um, from these plants that Poinsett collected was in 1836. Um, so you have botanical magazines that would draw these beautiful pictures. What's in interesting to me, endlessly fascinating, is you look at that and you say, my gosh, either this artist had a, was very, very creative or he wasn't actually drawing a picture of a wild poinsettia. If we look at this as a wild poinsettia and that's what the guy drew. 
I don't know, very imaginative. Or what I think this suggests is that poinsett did not collect a wild poinsettia. He collected a plant out of the a marketplace where the Aztecs had already domesticated this plant and grew it with bigger bracts, a little more showy plant than what you would find in the wild. And so really uh, the breeding started back in the, in the uh, probably the 1500, Montezuma was well known for having uh, the first botanical gardens. The Europeans claimed to have the first botanical gardens, but you'll notice that the, the oldest botanical gardens in Italy are in the uh, 1500s, soon, 1515 I think is the day, soon after, um, you know, the first explorers were in Mexico and saw what Montezuma had done and already had created a botanical garden. They took the idea back and started doing the same thing in Europe. So this is the oldest known variety that we still have today, uh, oak leaf. It's from 1923. And so my suspicion is this is much more like what uh, the plant that Poinsett would have sent uh, to the US rather than a, a, a true wild plant. Uh, something that already had some domestication, bigger bracts, uh, a little showier plant than the wild type. Another example of how the plant took on really quite quickly in the States is, um, uh, and how connected Poinsett was politically, uh, James Polk was elected in 1844, and they had inaugural balls back then, and his wife Sarah had a beautiful dress, and if you look on the dress, there are poinsettias. And this, again, not, you know, this is less than uh, two decades, 16 years after the plant ever arrived on the sh in, uh, in the Northeast. And it's already being uh, put on. And, and, and the, the, uh, the reason was Polk was recognizing the value of Poinsett uh, as a political ally and, and recognizing the work that he had done in Mexico. So they put this plant that he was, it was already being called a Poinsettia at that time and put it on, uh, got it on his wife's inaugural ball dress. We'll jump forward to 1873, and the next big, uh, or next interesting step uh, of, uh, was that there was another European explorer, and this guy was a, a, uh, an, or an orchid hunter. He, um, he, was, he would uh, go uh, uh, and collect orchids and sell them. Well, he found a poinsettia in Mexico in 1872 um, that we call a double poinsettia. And so what it has, instead of having cyathea in the middle, true male-female reproductive parts, all of those uh, true flower sexual parts have become petaloid. They, they, they show up as petals rather than um, true flowers. And so it's called a double flower. And of course we do this with roses. You know, wild roses have five petals, but the roses that we sell all the time now have a hundred petals. It's because all those reproductive parts have become petaloid. And and so this plant, interestingly enough, was sold for $1,000 uh, in 1880, 1873. A, uh, a New York florist um, was flaunting his wealth and, and, and bragged about how much he paid for it in the local newspapers. And, um, and, and, but what was interesting, one of the leading uh, garden writers at the time, his name was Robert Boost, and he wrote this about the double poinsettia, which is uh, interesting. He said, since the introduction of the poinsettia from Mexico 40 years ago, it has been without rival as a distinct scarlet bracted winter decorative plant. Also, note that he says it's a winter decorative plant. He doesn't call it a Christmas plant. It is now, however, likely to be effectually superseded by a new and totally distinct form recently discovered in Mexico, namely the double poinsettia. So he was predicting that no one is going to grow the poinsettia as we have known it up to this point in the last 40 years, because this plant is so much more beautiful than, than the regular poinsettia, the single flower poinsettia, that everybody's only going to want to grow the double flower and, and it'll, it'll totally wipe out the old one. Just like roses. We don't really see a lot of single flowering roses. They're all doubles. Well, that has proved to be quite wrong. Uh, you don't see double flowering poinsettias anywhere today, uh, which is interesting. The poinsettia in the 19th century was not the Christmas flower. And I will, um, 
I guess, try to prove that to you by showing you some Christmas cards from the late 1800s. And we'll show you what plants are important to the people in the 1800s and what they associated with Christmas. Christmas, the Christmas plants in the 1800s were, this is holly, yeah, and this is mistletoe, yeah. So holly and mistletoe were like, and ivy uh, were, the, were the big ones. Uh, here's another uh, holly um, being shown in a Christmas card. We've got Santa looking somewhat modern um, with carrying some uh, holly branches. We have all these people talking to Santa on the phone, and uh, he's uh, all these kids, and uh, he looks like Santa. But these notice the plants around here are primarily holly plants. They even on their Christmas cards at that time they had a lot of what we'd call spring plants. Seems a little seems odd now, but here are roses on this Christmas card. We have uh, roses here. Merry Christmas. We have carnations. Dianthus. Uh, we have sweet peas with children's faces in them. Uh, we have tulips. Merry Christmas with tulips. Um, but they look kind of peculiar. And you don't see a poinsettia in any of these. Here we have uh, a choir. But you notice the flowers around here, if you recognize those, those are passiflora or passion flower. So we hit. Oh, and, and actually, there's there, there's some bizarre stuff, too, that I don't know what they were thinking. Here we have, like, a Katie did with a tambourine celebrating a frog and a, maybe a cockroach doing a dance. Um, you've got some birds that are looking like they're ready to torch somebody. Um, may all jollity lighten your Christmas hours. Uh, it looks kind of scary to me, but, uh, yeah. So, but once we turn the century, 1900s, the picture has changed. The, the plant has become uh, associated with Christmas for the first time. You won't find anything prior to 1900 where poinsettia is, is, is attached to Christmas. You have growers starting to grow the plant and sell the plant as cut flowers during the Christmas season. And I'll show you these pictures. So these are all early 1900s. California's Christmas flower. You could grow poinsettias in Southern California on the coast outdoors year-round or South Florida. Here's 1906 poinsettia blossoms. Merry Christmas. 1906 more poinsettias. Um, you can see it all of a sudden it, it the page has turned. It is now a commercial product and we're starting to see it attached to Christmas regularly. And growers now in greenhouses are growing the plants um, for for the winter holidays, um, primarily selling them as cut flowers, big tall because they were big plants. They would get several feet long, or you could grow them as a potted plant. But they didn't make a very good potted plant. They weren't very popular as a potted plant um, for a couple reasons. Um, they didn't branch. The stems were erect um, and and kind of naked. And then as soon as this plant was put into a low light home environment, uh, the leaves fall off. Like in 48 hours, you have no leaves left on this plant. The bracts would stay on, the leaves would fall off. And so what growers would do is they would actually plant a fern in the middle of the pot so that you would have some greenery um, when these leaves would fall off. But you know, not that showy of a pot, but that's 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 how we sold potted plants. Here's an uh, uh, advertisement, 18, 1917. You can see they're selling some foliage plants and begonias at, at, for the Christmas season. Christmas peppers, um, which would be a, you know an ornamental pepper. Um, but this is what their poinsettias look like. You put three plants in a pot and they'd have fairly naked looking stems. So what changed next was that a guy named um, Paul Ecke, his family had immigrated from Germany to California uh, in the uh, really at the turn of the century, around 1900, and they they were growing. You know, they had milk production and and eggs, and and they did different things. And then when Paul, the one of the sons, took over the business 
uh, in about 1922, he really started pushing the cut flower poinsettia market. They were close enough to Hollywood that they would um, cut, uh, their, their business was actually on where it is now Sunset Boulevard uh, in, in Los Angeles, and they would cut uh, poinsettias, field grown poinsettias as cut flowers and sell them on the roadside. Um, and so it really became a poinsettia business. And, and the Ecky name, his name was Paul Ecky, the Ecky name really became synonymous with the poinsettia for the next hundred years. You could, they, if, if it was a poinsettia, it was from Ecky. Um, they, they really have dominated the, the market and I'll explain why uh, as we go through this. Uh, the U.S. patent system started in the 1930s, 1930. And so one of the initial, this was plant patent number 176. So it was pretty early in the, this is the first poinsettia, 19, number 176. This is the first poinsettia that was um, patented. And you can see it is the double poinsettia um, that, that Paul Ecke ended up patenting and, and naming it uh, Henrietta Ecke. Basically all the varieties that he came up with at that time uh, he would name them after family members, and Henry, Henrietta was his mother. Uh, so that was a 1936 introduction. And this is actual uh, Henrietta Ecke that I have grown in my greenhouses um, uh, in recent years. Um, and the business model that the Eckes had was we would grow cut flowers for December Christmas sales. And so that's what this is a picture of workers harvesting cut flower stems out of the field. And then you could follow that up with um, letting the, because the, these were like shrubs outside. And, and so then you would let them go dormant um, as they do in the wild. They, they, they grow during the wet season, then it goes dormant in, in where these are native to in Mexico in February, Mar January, February, March. And they, they lose all their leaves and they just look like brown stems. And so they let them go dormant. They shear them off in the field, and then they go through and they bare root them. They just yank them up out of the soil, uh, bundle them up, take them to a barn, and pack the different varieties that they had. These are the variety names on the, on the stalls here, and pack them into there. And then they would load them in cardboard boxes, put the boxes on trucks, take them to the local uh, railroad station, uh, and that's how they would get to the East Coast growers. And you would do this uh, in, in March, uh, April. The growers would, on the East Coast, Midwest, would get their boxes of, we call them dormant canes. Is this a stick is all it is. Uh, but poinsettia roots well from just having a stick. You don't need anything else. You don't need leaves. And you, you, you root the stick, you grow the plants through the summer, and then uh, sell them uh, at Christmas. So that was the market. And then this is what a greenhouse would look like in the early 1900s full of poinsettias. They tend to, again, be pretty tall and lanky. And, and then, again, this is what they look like in a potted plant. So one of the interesting techniques that the growers did at this time, because the plants would get so tall, and if you were trying to sell it as a potted plant, not as a cut flower, you really needed a shorter plant. And they didn't really know how to do that very well, except if they would bend the stems. And so what they would do is they take a big, long stem, and you actually macerate the stem with your fingers, and it bends down. And you macerate it again, and it bends up. And, and so you would shrink the length of this stem from being really long to being short. And so it would look better in the pot. And, uh, and th this was a, a common technique used to make a, a decent looking potted plant. And you put a little twist tie around it so that it would uh, uh, look okay. All right, <clears throat> so we'll jump ahead to the 1950s. Um, Paul Ecke named a variety after one of his daughters, Barbara Ecke Supreme, and this was the dominant variety in the 50s you might not be able to appreciate the scale on this plant, but that inflorescence is 20, 24 inches across. It's huge. The cyathea are the size of your fingers. This was what we called a tetraploid. It had double the chromosome number. The plant had just naturally sported and, and increased the chromosome number. And, and, and so this, this was, you know, really seen as impressive, um, really big. So it really was a cut flower variety. It was difficult to grow it in a container, but this was the dominant container grown variety in the 50s. The USDA got involved in, you know, they, I, 
realized that, hey, this is a really valuable crop now. We need to have a scientist dedicated to breeding poinsettia. And so they had a uh, one of their scientists um, started learning how to breed poinsettia and, and really launched the, um, the exploration of the genetic potential of this plant. And, and he really cr started to create a more compact plants with bigger bracts, um, looking much more like a modern day poinsettia. This is an example of the fields that Eki would have in California. And it was said at one time you could drive from LA down to San Diego and never be out of sight of a field of poinsettias. Um, uh, their main facility was in Encinitas, just, south, just north of uh, San Diego. But this is what it looked like, where again, you have acreage of plants being grown um, for cut flowers and then for the dormant canes that would be shipped across the country. And it became, as the plant became more and more popular as a holiday plant, then the dormant canes became the real market because there aren't, there wasn't that much demand for cut flowers. And it, the cut flower, you could only really sell locally in Southern California. You couldn't ship these very long distances. They didn't hold up that well. <clears throat> so then was a, a, a twist in what happened. You know, Eki was the king of the poinsettias in the 50s and the early 60s. And then this small Ohio grower, um, with no experience in breeding at all, uh, starts to uh, do some crosses, you know, where you would take pollen from one plant, go to another, grow some seedlings and have something unique. And, and, and he got lucky because um, the biggest problem with the poinsettia in this era was that the leaves would fall off. That was the biggest limitation. As soon as you put it in a, a little bit of a cold environment or a dry or a dark environment, the leaves fall off. And then, you know, that limits its market potential. And so this guy named Jim Mickelson, he was doing some breeding. He's looking at his seedlings, you know, he grows them out, has them flowering and said, oh, these all look okay, but nothing's unique. Well, it's the story is told that he threw them all in the dumpster and then came back like a week later and he noticed some of the one plant in the dumpster still looked really good. And he pulled it back out of the dumpster and said, maybe that we have something here and he named the plant after his father paul mickelson and and what this variety had was leaf retention was the was what the term was used the leaves wouldn't fall off so quickly and within two years paul mickelson totally wiped out the ecchi market everybody grew ecchi varieties they were the main supplier and all of a sudden everybody switches to Paul Mickelson as this is now the new, you know, you have to grow this one because it's so much better. And, and so, and Mickelson would make them available. He, they would sell them to people as rooted cuttings. So you'd take a cutting, root it, and then sell them in trays. And this was much easier than buying dormant canes shipped in a railroad car from California. And so the Yucky business kind of really got pushed to the side and, and they were, you know, not doing well. And Mickelson was becoming the king of the poinsettia because only his varieties uh, were were popular. <clears throat> so Paul, Paul Ecke um, has a son, Paul Ecke Jr. And so now we'll call him Paul Ecke Sr. Paul Ecke, he realizes he needs to become more of an aggressive breeding, has an aggressive breeding program. What he was doing at, up to this point was simply, you know, when you grow acres and acres of plants, you get natural things happen you have mutations form, the plant sports, and you get something different, you collect that one, and then you call it a new name. So he wasn't breeding poinsettias. He was just, again, you have millions of these things. You're going to get some natural variation. That's interesting. And you take those cuttings and you've got a new variety. Well, breeding means you're more actively pursuing certain characteristics and traits that you want these plants to look like. So Paul Ecke says, I need to have a breeder. Uh, what am I going to do? And he realizes, you know, he, he's got this guy who is the gardener and he's a, a another German immigrant who had come over and he had a, he was a, he and his wife were tailors. Um, and his wife was the uh, nanny for Paul's uh, junior's children. And, and so she's already working on the farm at the, they called it the ranch. She's works on the ranch cause she's the nanny and, Paul Sr. says, you know, the nanny's husband seems like a pretty bright guy. Uh, rather than have him sweeping leaves in the garden, maybe we'll have him breed some poinsettias for us. And so they showed him how to do it. And the, and the technique's simple. You take, a, you take a paintbrush 
and you dabble on some male flowers, you collect the pollen, you go over to a female, you pollinate her, and then you come back a couple months later, you collect the seeds, you grow them out and see what you get. And, and so they started to do this. And, and so the guy's name is Franz Fruworth. And so he becomes the breeder. And in three years, he has, you know, luckily, serendipitously, um, come up with an introduction that he calls C1, not a creative name, but, but was an absolutely beautiful plant. This is the first poinsettia that really, really looks like a modern poinsettia. And if you grew it today, it's comparable and showing this to a modern poinsettia. The only thing it doesn't have really is the bracts are kind of a little uh, light red and the gr leaves are light green. And today's marketplace demands a, a really uh, deep red and a deep green, almost black leaf. Um, so these, you know, they look faded if you put them next to a modern poinsettia. But the characteristics, cyathea in the center that are really tight and a lot of them, and then you got a, just a whole bunch of bracts that are just super showy. And and so Eki's back in business and kind of as, as um, because Franz did such a good job at finding a, a, the next generation of plant, people are interested in switching from Paul Mickelson back to Eki. So they kind of regain their crown as the kings of the poinsettias. The other thing that happens at the same time is just an absolutely incredible story, and it's what makes poinsettia different than any other plant in the world, is that there's this little Norwegian guy. His name is Termod Haig, and I had the benefit of meeting him many years ago. He's this, he's a grower, a good grower, in his you know, little Norwegian greenhouse. He walks into the greenhouse one day, and he sees a plant that looks like this, and he recognizes that there's something unique about this plant. He's got a lot of poinsettia in his, in his greenhouses, but he's got one that's different because your normal poinsettia looks like that. And, and growers typically would grow what we call straight ups. One stem gives you one flower and they would put three or four or five plants in a pot to make a nice potted plant. What Termod Haig realized, he has a plant here that has a characteristic that we end up referring to as free branching. On the left is traditional branching. This is what all poinsettias look like. They're kind of gangly still. They still look, they have that habit of the wild one still. Termit Haig finds a free branching plant in his greenhouse. It's, you pinch it just like you pinch cannabis to increase, to increase branching. But instead of getting, you know, a few upright stems like this on the left, you get a whole bunch of nice lateral branches on the left. The plant's more compact, and this is what a potted plant is supposed to look like. And if I can get one plant to branch like that, I can put one plant in a pot. I don't have to put three or four. And so, well, that's a no-brainer economically. I can save a lot of money. Price is going to be cheaper. I'm going to make more money on this. And my costs are going to be lower. So all of a sudden, as this gets developed, and it takes them a few years to have become developed, but in really in the late 60s, this is starting to become a thing. Growers realize, hey, I don't want old, straight up traditional branching varieties. I want a free branching variety. And so Termit Haig named the plant uh, Annette Haig after his granddaughter pictured here. And, and it was introduced in 1968. And just to give you an appreciation, this is Annette Haig this is Paul Mickelson. Um, and, and of course, there's really no comparison there if you're trying to grow a, a potted plant. The one on the right is, is, you know, is a commercial plant, not the one on the left. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, if you've met any breeder or anybody that's in the business of breeding, you will you know, quickly realize that what breeders do is, well, you steal from your competitors, right? Because you can't patent sexually propagated plants. You can patent a clone, right? So every plant is the same. I can, I can patent that. Um, but if I do a sexual cross and produce seeds, you know, it's, you're, you know, it's the, no holds barred. You know, I, so what I do as a breeder is I can go to the garden center even, and I find somebody that's growing impatiens or begonias or poinsettias, and there's a really good looking one. 
I can take the pollen from that plant, add it, put it on, dust it onto another plant, get some seedlings, and I will soon have a plant that looks, you know, has a lot of great characteristics. And so I'm basically, you know, I'm kind of stealing. I'm, it's legal, so I guess you shouldn't call it stealing. I'm borrowing my co competitor's genetics. I'm taking the traits that this person has put a lot of time into developing into this plant and put them into my plant. And then I can sell my plant as being just as good as their plant. And that's all fine. That's what we do. Well, the thing with everybody sees Annette Haig, this is a free branching plant. I need free plant branching. So I take pollen from Annette Haig. I pollinate another Annette Haig or another plant. And I get that free branching characteristic into my seedlings. And soon I'm in the marketplace. It takes me a couple years. I'm behind, but I catch up quickly. Well, the thing is with Annette Haig is, I can grow a thousand seedlings, ten thousand, a hundred thousand seedlings. I can grow seedlings from 1968 to 2021, and not a single one of them has ever had the free branching characteristic in it. None. No seedling from Annette Haig branches freely like its mother or its parent. What's going on here? We don't know, but. Eki has Eki actually contracts with Haig, so Eki becomes the seller of the Haig genetics, and so Annette Haig is Eki's plant. So Eki is dominant. They're the only people in the world that have free branching. They don't know how they got it, but they got it, and so their plants are really popular. So they're dominating the 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 seventies, and then. Paul Sr. Uh, Jim, j j just quickly, so does that imply that uh, everything was clonal? No. Well, I mean, poinsettias are clonal in that you, they're always propagated by cutting. But in the breeding process, you do sexual crosses, right? And, and, and when you do crosses with Annette Haig, you do not get free brand. That, that characteristic does not come with the genes. That's the bottom line. Got it. It's not a genetic characteristic, yeah. Um, it's something else. So Paul Sr., he was European, he's German born, and his wife was Swiss, and they lived in California most of their lives, but they were born and, and raised in, in uh, uh, early life in Europe. So they would go back to Europe every summer, and, and he had a big, they sold poinsettias, a lot of poinsettias in Europe. They were the dominant supplier in Europe, as well as North America. And so he would go back every summer and visit his customers, and and he decided, you know, he, he heard about this guy named Gregor Gutbier. And Gutbier was a, a, a German fellow that uh, had a little breeding, uh, a little greenhouse in his backyard that I have had the pleasure to visit. Um, he's no longer alive, but the greenhouse is still there. The, his family uses it as a uh, little sauna. And uh, he had a little greenhouse in the backyard. And he would... Uh, he was he was playing with different plants, including poinsettia, and and when Paul Senior visited him, I, I suspect he didn't know what he was getting into, but he walked into Goopier's greenhouse and he sees all these free branching plants, and they're not Annette Haig, and he's like, "How did you do this?" <laughs> and, and of course, Goopier doesn't want to tell him right off, but Paul was smart. He offers him five thousand dollars on the spot if he tells him and offers them royalties. So anytime I, if you tell me your technology and anytime I use it for any future poinsettia that I produce, I'll pay you a royalty on every single clone, every single cutting, I'll give you a, you know, a couple pennies on and that's gonna be a lot of money if this goes well. And so Goopier sells them the technology for 5,000 bucks in royalties. And what Goopier did was this, he took, on the left, we would have a uh, non-branching plant. So, you know, it's just a variety that traditional plant that doesn't branch. He would bring in a net hag and he would graft them together. And something, we don't know what at this point, it's going to move from the, oh, I have this backwards, I'm sorry. The, the, the green one is the free branching plant. The blue one is the non-branching plant. And something would move from the free branching plant into the non-branching plant. And then the free branch, the non-branching plant on the right would become free branching. And every cutting or clone that you harvest from this plant 
for the next 20 years is going to also be free branching. So you graft once and you can get this free branching characteristic into any poinsettia. And then what you do, actually what you sever the this plant, you sever that one. And so now you have a free branching plant. You had free branching rootstock, non-branching scion, and now the scion, the vegetative part, is now all free branching. The characteristic has been transmitted from the left to the right, from branching to non-branching. What this, and so that, then that is what your plant looks like. And to today, every poinsettia that you buy in the store is grafted at one point in its life because that is the only way to get branching into a poinsettia. And so this is what it looks like. You have, you can see the, the plant on the left, plant on the right. I've wrapped the, the, uh, the, the union, the graft in some tape. And then once it has taken hold, I sever this one, I sever that one. And now I have a free branching plant. I take cuttings for the next 20 years. Yeah, every, every plant has, has whatever it is. We don't know what it is at this point, but it works. And so Eki, learned this technology in the mid 70s from Gutbier and they didn't tell anybody. And so for the next 10 years, 12 years, nobody else in the world uh, can compete with them. So for basically 10 years, they have Annette Haig and that's really working well, you know, from the 68 to 76. Now they learn how to actually get that and nobody else has free branching plants. So you have them, you basically, you have a monopoly on this thing for, for 10 years. And then you actually learn how to do it yourself and you create a whole bunch of new varieties that are free branching and nobody can compete with you. You are the poinsettia grower in the whole world because nobody else knows how to do this. Until you get some scientists that think, well, this is a really cool problem. Let's see if we can figure this out. Um, so after you have this this basically monopoly for two decades and and, the Eki name is the same as saying poinsettia. You say Eki, it's you might as well say poinsettia. There are two scientists at the University of Minnesota. Harold Wilkins, who unfortunately passed away this past year, and his graduate student, uh, John Dole, who is now a dean and uh, a horticulturist at NC State University. They decide they're going to try to figure this out in the mid 80s. And um, and effectively, they they release the secret, and uh, and of course, the poinsettia world has been very competitive since then. Eki like, kind of lost their hold on it, and um, Harold Wilkins would tell the story that you know he sent his graduate student John to Europe to give a talk at an international horticulture meeting, and John was telling people basically how you get free branching is grafting. And John was looking down at his notes and giving his presentation to all these European growers in the audience. And when he looked up from his notes, he realized there was nobody left in the audience. That once he had revealed the secret, all the European growers had all immediately vanished from the room and had already started their own breeding programs. Um, Harold is known to have exaggerated, but... Um, yeah, and so really within a couple of years, then there's you know other major players um, that uh, have their own free branching genetics. It wasn't until the really the early 1990s, 1991, that USDA scientists published uh, conclusively what this branching agent is, um, and what it is is a phytoplasma. A phytoplasma is uh, a bacterium that lacks cell walls, and when that bacterium gets into a plant cell, it can affect the hormonal concentrations in the plant and the hormones in that plant then uh, affect branching. And so for all other plants that we know of, and phytoplasmas are not rare, but when you get phytoplasmas in the plants, they tend to be pathogenic. They, they cause diseases and they cause growth that is undesirable. And so we're usually trying to prevent phytoplasmas from occurring. Poinsettia is the only plant that we know of that uh, phytoplasmas have, uh, you know, created some beneficial response. Um, and so today, if you want to breed poinsettias, 
you you have to do sexual crosses. You have to take pollen from a, a, a mother and a father, and, and, or from the father, put it on the mother. You grow seeds. The seeds never branch. And so you don't have a commercial plant until then you take a free branching plant, you graft it to your seedling, you get the branching characteristic, the phytoplasma moves from the free branching rootstock into your seedling. And now you have a plant that you can evaluate for commercial success. So today, every poinsettia that you see will have uh, phytoplasma in it from, you know. Uh, now, how does it get into it in nature? Uh, usually it's insects. Um, uh, there are uh, leaf hoppers will suck enough solution out of one plant and and then ingest check it into another plant when they feed on, a, on an uninfected plant. So you, that's how it's usually transmitted in nature. Um, uh, yep. We do not know uh, how the phytoplasma got into the uh, poinsettia in the Norwegian greenhouse. Um, I have my ideas. Um, the, the, the real irony of the whole situation is that what appears to have happened is that a Paul Mickelson variety, uh, or Paul Mickelson, the variety Paul Mickelson, uh, was infected with um, the phytoplasma. And when, because today, and I've done this personally, if I take a Paul Mickelson variety and I put phytoplasma in it by grafting, the plant that I get is a net hag. Annette Haig is just Paul Mickelson with phytoplasma. And of course, you know, Annette Haig became the ownership of the Ecky Ranch. And so, you know, Paul Mickelson lost the business back to the Eckies. And the reality is the and Annette Haig really was his plant. And legally, if it were today, he you know, the Eckies would not have ownership over that plant. But but at that time we didn't understand what caused the free branching. So uh uh, there were actually lawsuits filed and uh, argued in Norway that uh, that the Higgs and the Eckies won. Um, so uh, Mickelson lost control of or the plant that actually probably was his. All right. So the, the end of this story really is that then, you know, Paul Jr. was quite the marketing guy. His, you know, his father really got the business going, but he was a, he was a, a market, marketing guy. And so he really pushed the poinsettia to be, really synonymous with Christmas. Not just a good looking flower, but this is the Christmas flower. And so through his marketing efforts, we had you know three decades of just linear growth where we went from a you know forty million dollars a year in sales to over two hundred and fifty million dollars in, in basically you know twenty five years. Uh, it just skyrocketed. And you know he just used some good marketing techniques. Um, uh, you know for example product placement before we, you know, you, you think of product placement as, you know, now it's all the time in movies and stuff, you know, he would get poinsettias in the most unusual of places. Um, he would get them on TV sets. Uh, this is the Diana Shore or Diana Shore show. He would give the poinsettias, and this is actually Paul uh, Jr. here talking to Diana Shore, and then news TV broadcast, he would get them on the sets and of course, he was not far from LA. He was in Southern California, and so you know he had a lot of influence and you know, made relationships in the in the TV world. And and um, you know on the, the the Tonight Show, Johnny Carson, and then later Jay Leno always had poinsettias at Christmas, always. And so it just he just hammered that home that the poinsettia is the Christmas flower, and and that really is 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 what has uh, driven uh, the plant. Um, uh, it's been good marketing and then continued good breeding over the past several decades. So really poinsettia is no longer just a Christmas flower. It's not one of the options. It is the option that we associate with Christmas. So that is basically the story, how you take a gangly Mexican shrub and, and make it into a, a holiday icon. That was awesome. Thanks. Are there, we have any questions? We comments? do. Well, so my my uh, I, I guess some of my first questions because there are and everybody start throwing your questions up. But um, you you sort of touched on this, but uh, the the recent project in Mexico to kind of document the different 
genetic expressions from different, I guess, microclimates or varietals, that was going to be my question, which is, you know, the poinsettia, you showed a bunch of red dots of them growing all over. And, and so it is, they do express themselves. The, the poinsettia in one location looks different than those growing wild in another location. Yes. Okay. That's awesome. So, so similar to cannabis, right? You have the, right. Uh, like, so yeah, there's, there, there, there have been now pretty nice genetic studies done where you, you, you collect from different populations and you can, you can show what the gene flow occurred was so they can show where the hotbed of genetic variation is, um, which is in the state of Guerrero, uh, South of Mexico city, um, which is where the, the city of Taxco is and where Joel Poinsett collected those first poinsettias. That's where there's the most genetic diversity. And then you can go up the coast, the Pacific coast or down the Pacific coast and, and, and the, the, uh, you know, the plants clearly spread from that area in those two directions. And um, uh, and so there's actually not as much diversity in those two directions where the, where the epicenter of diversity is, is right in the, the state of Guerrero. Yeah. And, and there, it's interesting. Go ahead. Well, and there's there's there there is a uh, one whole uh, ravine in Michoacan that is only white poinsettias. And uh, and my host uh, said we cannot go there. The, the that is right in the middle of the, one of the drug cartel areas, and uh, it would not be safe. So we did. But there is one area that is just white. Um, the other thing that's interesting too, I'll, you know, there's only been a few events in the history of the poinsettia where we've gone back to the original germplasm. You know, really, poinsettias have only been shipped from Mexico to the states a few times, and so all the genetic variation you see today in greenhouses and garden centers and stores is a result of really a handful of plants, um, not a wide variety. So for example, um, there was a pink variety found in the 1950s that was shipped to the US, a genetically pink one. And so pretty much all the main pink ones today are from that one uh, or associated with that one pink. Um, so we haven't gone back to the source a whole lot to bring in a broader gene pool. There's a huge potential to do that. It's a lot of work because um, once you start introducing the wild type, you're going to get all the junk that comes with the wild type. And so it's going to take a lot of generations of crosses to bring in some new trait from the wild type to the, because the domesticated one is so superior in terms of performance and appearance that, you know, you have to find some, trait to make it worthwhile going back to the wild type. And the trait that that I would argue is the is the holy grail is white fly resistance. If you know the problem, big problem we have with poinsettias is, is that they get white flies and it's really hard to not get white flies. So we, you know you have to do a lot of work with either biological controls or pesticides to keep the white flies off. If we could find a wild type poinsettia that had white fly resistance, you know, gosh, that's worth millions of dollars. And so while I'm traveling in Mexico, I'm, I'm, I'm talking with one of the breeders who has collected plants from across the country, and he has them all at his research station. It's a government research station. And so I say to him, I said, do you have any that are white fly resistant? <laughs> this is a very valuable thing because, you know, they don't, they don't have a good perception of what the market really is. Um, it's, it's just different there. And he said, oh, yeah, we have white fly resistance. And I'm like, oh, my God, you know, I got to see this. And so we go out to his field and and it's it's a it's like a football field full of poinsettia shrubs that he's collected from across the country. And he walks me over to this one. It has all of its leaves on it and it's a big plant. And he said, this one's resistant. And I grab it and I shake it, and I'm telling you, there's a million white flies go flying from this thing. <laughs> it's like, this is, what is this? This is not resistant. And he said, oh, yeah, look, all the leaves are still on the plant. If you look at all these other ones, the white flies infect them, and the, and the leaves all fall off. And so this one is resistant to the white flies. <laughs> well, no, they, they love feeding on it, but the, it just doesn't happen to drop its leaves. So anyway, we don't have white rat fly resistance yet, but that would that would be a, a reason to go back to the, you know, try to find some in the wild or to, you know, try to, all we need is one. Because when you have an asexually propagated plant, all you need is one. 
uh, you don't need uh, a whole bunch of them. Yeah. So we just to give you some context, we've talked a lot about kind of wild land race, heirloom cultivated, uh, you know, varietals. And, and you had mentioned that the, the, there's obviously the wild stuff in Mexico, but that the Aztecs and, and Mexicans and the people who were indigenous, indigenously there uh, were selecting for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So there was human intervention. And like, I think you mentioned Montezuma had a botanical garden. Yeah. Yeah, he was well known for liking plants. And there, there was actually a few generations of family that were all called, there was Montezuma, you know, different ones. But, but the, 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 the story is that, you know, um, they would have runners, these long distance runners would run like marathons daily to bring cut flowers to, you know, his living residence in Mexico City. Because Mexico City is, you know, a little cloudier, cooler climate. Um, and so, you know, a little bit further away was a better climate for growing flowers. And so they would run these flowers. So he'd have fresh flowers around his house. And yeah, so the, the, they were really known to have the, the first botanical gardens. And they, they really were medicinal gardens. That's why you were collecting plants primarily was for the medicinal characteristics. But, you know, there's, there's quite a number of important Mexican plants that uh, are uh, Mexican plants that are important ornamentals. Um, and I suspect they did some significant uh, um, collection of those and improvement, things like marigolds, uh, zinnias, um, I think dahlias uh, are things that I would expect that uh, they made some significant uh, improvements, just selections. You grow, you know, you have a lot of seedlings and you see one happens to have a bigger flower and you choose that one and you keep doing that for tens and hundreds of years and you have something that really, really no longer is comparable to the wild type. Yeah. And, and I, when I think, you know, I think improvement depends on who you are and what your perspective is. Cause I, I, yeah. I view the modern Christmas season in America poinsettia as like the shiny red apple of, yeah. you know, it, it looks, it has that bag appeal. And in the cannabis world, we talk about this too. Like the, the ugly heirloom tomato has more taste uh, than yeah. the, the pretty grocery store versions. And, yeah. uh, and so I'm just looking at. Um, well, you know, this is the nature of commercialization is you, you go to the mass appeal and the mass appeal sometimes isn't uh, the best. Right. Um, in fact, when I grow wild ones, people always come into my greenhouse and say, wow, why don't we grow modern poinsettias to look like these? Because these really look cool. Um, and uh, there is some effort to have some like I talked about the hybrid euphorbias really do uh, look a bit more like wild types. Um, they're a much more beautiful plant, but yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, uh, and, and it's like, the, yeah, I, I think my mind was blown. I mean, you know, I, I knew nothing about the history and that's why I thought this would be cool to have you give everybody the history. Cause I think 99% of the people watching didn't know any of this and that it didn't always look like the shiny red apple of, uh, <laughs> of poinsettia plants. So c can you just quickly talk about like, you mentioned some of the other ornamentals, you know, what was the rose 500 years ago also something that did not look like the modern rose in everyone's garden or like what, what are some of the other plants that just have transformed over the past couple hundred years through human intervention to the ornamental we know in every grocery store where we buy well, flowers or what, whatever. But I, 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 it, it's certainly not an ornamental. You take corn. You know, corn is actually native to the same area that Mexico is, uh, that poinsettia is. You see a wild corn plant, it, you would not recognize it. It has one kernel. It's this little grass with one kernel, or sometimes I have a, a little sheath of kernels. It looks nothing like anything we eat, and yet people, you know, you know corn is natural and healthy, and it's like, well, you know, but it's not at all. It's a man-made product. Um, it's same thing, like, have you ever gone hiking and tripped over a cabbage? anywhere you know there's nothing in the world that looks like a cabbage except in in cabbage fields you know we 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 have totally changed almost all the plants that we consume apples you know you don't you won't go anywhere in the world and find an apple 
falling on your head that is that size. It, it, that doesn't happen. Um, everything has been transformed. With the, I would say the exception is some tropical fruits. Um, there are some you know fruits that we eat that the from the tropics that are not all that distant from the um, uh, the, the the originals, um, but uh, everything you know. I always find it curious that how you know we the the foods we perceive as being so uh, natural are there if if they are not genetically modified organisms what are you know I mean they they we we have, we have modified the appearance and the size and the flavor of everything that we consume from whether it be meat products or plant products it's this you know, these things just don't hardly exist in the wild. We've had to change them because, and it's been to our benefit. Um, but uh, yeah, go go look up uh, what, wow, you know, the indigenous corn. You just wonder how anybody ever got that into thinking what a modern day corn plant looks like. There, there's, 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 you would never in a million years think that's going to evolve or be, you know, made into an ear of corn. Um, yeah. In, so it seems like, you know, a big goal of all these breeders was achieved the kind of short squat plants that have lots of branches. So as we fast forward to the 2020s, I guess my two main questions are like, what, what do you see at the forefront of poinsettia innovation? Like what are they, what are people trying to achieve? Is it different colors for just for, for fun or is it even denser, shorter, squatter? And then you, in the past, you mentioned Southern California as kind of a hotbed of, of, of commercial production. Where are the bulk of poinsettias sold throughout the U.S. during Christmas season grown now versus 25 years ago? Sure. So... Um... The way the poinsettia market wor works is you, you can breed poinsettias anywhere. So there's breeders and there's one, there's only a few in the world. There's one in California and there's a couple in Europe. Um, uh, yeah, that's about it. Is the Eki, is the Eki family still? No, they, they sold the business um, in, uh, in 2012, I think it was. And, uh, you know, so they, the breeder that they have now is still there, but, you know, they operate under a different name. And so the family is completely out. And so it's kind of like Oldsmobiles and cars. You know, it was a big name at one time and, and it kind of has disappeared. Um, and so, but they, they still breed in Encinitas, California there. So, so once you, you, you know, you, you're looking for certain traits because you're always trying to improve these things. Most of the de most of the time, I'd say now we're looking for production traits, not for appearance or consumer traits. You know, we really can't get the plant to look a whole lot better. If assuming you like the big red ball, um, you can't. You know, it's it's as good as it gets. I mean, you can't get more red on it. Um, you can. You know, we can have shorter ones, taller ones, and we can do that. But you know, it's it's a good. It kind of maxed out its potential in in terms of visual qualities, in my opinion. Um, uh, unless we kind of go to some old style bracts, or you know, there's some of that, but that'd be a niche market. Um, mostly, the breeding is for production characteristics, things that give growers problems. So, for example, uh, in recent years, we've improved the stem strength a lot. So you would have these nice branch plants, but then the branches break off easily when you take them home. So now we have plants that are strong so you can like drop them on a concrete floor and they don't fall apart um the one that i'm most interested in and we are working on in my 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 research on poinsettias today is all based on uh heat issues so with climate change you have different you know uh temperature patterns and you have parts of the country that are experiencing hotter fall weather than they've had in the past and poinsettia is susceptible to heat delay meaning the plants initiate flowers in September, early October. And if you have high temperatures at that time, then flower initiation does not occur so quickly. And, and so you delay the initiation 
And then when initiation does take place, you still have eight weeks before it's going to be a marketable plant. And so now instead of initiating September 21st and marketing November 21st, you're initiating in you know October 5th. Well, that means it's going to be ready for sale December 5th, and that's too late. The market is not in December for wholesale poinsettias. You start shipping in you know, about the 10th of November to the, th the end of to December 1st in a wholesale facility. You hit December 1st and you want to be sweeping the floors in your greenhouse because it's empty. You don't have a market for these things if it's delayed. You, you know, there's there's a three week window to sell them. And if you have a two week delay on your flowering, you're in trouble. You're going to eat those plants. And so we are trying to understand uh, what causes and how to avoid heat delay. And, and so, and actually the real solution is going to be a genetic breeding solution. So we were working with the breeders to help them screen their varieties for heat delay so that then they, when they go to introduce something new and interesting, it already has those good characteristics. We don't get it into the marketplace and then the growers have crop failures finding out, oh, this is heat sensitive. I can't grow it. So, you know, they can identify the varieties that have the most heat resistance and make sure they're marketing in those, especially in, you know, Texas, Florida, Southeast, um, not so critical in, you know, the Pacific Northwest perhaps, but um, although Oregon had some pretty hot temperatures this fall. Um, so, so it's production characteristics that we're looking at um, uh, and heat delay being a good one. Um, things like susceptibility to diseases or, or, um, or, you know, you can still get improved branching or bigger leaves, smaller leaves. You know, there's some characteristics that, you know, make a, a plant a little bit better. Currently, there are uh, 140 approximately varieties um, that you could at least that you can get uh, poinsettia varieties. Um, we have different colors and those are interesting. But for the most part, uh, the poinsettia market is red and then white and white's popular because people like to paint them, do weird colors and sparkling and stuff on the glitter and all that's weird, but you know, people do buy it. Um, and so we get a lot of interesting colors, pinks and mar um, maroons or peachy yellows, oranges. We try to do poinsettias for Thanksgiving and had gold orange -ish colors. And that, that didn't go off all that well. They're really nice looking plants, but you know, people, did not associate them with Thanksgiving, even if the colors were the right colors. So, but, you know, basically you're just trying to get a, a better red, but the reality is there are a lot of good varieties to choose from and it gets, uh, it's a, it's competitive. Uh, um, it, it's hard to, you know, take, you're taking something that's near perfect and trying to improve it. And it, you know, so it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, we're not making huge advances like we we did through the 60s 70s 80s and 90s it's it's definitely slowed slowed down a lot so once you have identified a variety that's interesting what you do then is you produce the cuttings offshore so we do the mother plants it's you know as you know growing mother plants is very labor intensive and we don't have the labor and it's too expensive to do it in this country so there are no mother plants stock plants grown here uh, they are grown in uh, mexico uh, El Salvador, uh, Nicaragua, uh, Guatemala. Um, so Central America and, and Mexico are where the cuttings are produced. So you have large farms in maybe 20, 40 acres that just grow uh, mother plants. They harvest the cuttings. They ship them to our growers as unrooted cuttings. Our growers propagate them in July, in the early August, and then they grow them in their greenhouse for, for December. Um, sales or yeah, November, December sales. So that's kind of the, the, the scheme, the States that are important, you know, Southern California was just important back in the day because you could grow these things year round and in unheated greenhouses. So, and it was drier than say South Florida would be, you know, Florida, the humidity isn't that great. Um, so it was just one of the few places in the country where you can really do them well year round. And it was nice and cool and high light in the San Diego area. It's kind of perfect climate. And so, you know, that back in the day, that was the place to do it. Now, you know, there's no particular reason to be there. Um, uh, and so the growers, 
basically you have to have grow, you know, you can't ship these things very long distances in a, any sort of cost affordable manner. So, you know, you, you are not, not going to ship more than 500 miles in a truck. Um, so you're going to have locations in every state or every other state sort of thing. It's going to have a, some pretty big growers um, to take part of the, take care of the different parts of the country. So, um, so most, you know, most states have a, you know, a, you know, a dozen or so mid small grower, that would be somebody less than five acres that, you know, just does some stuff for local sales and, and uh, local garden centers. But, you know, it's, it's a mass market product for the most part. It's not a very profitable crop to grow at all. So you really have to grow it on a large scale to do well with it. So really what you have is a few really large growers um, sell to a, a large part of the market. And, and for the most part, the vast majority of plants are going to go through Walmart, Lowe's, or Home Depot nationally. Those are the big ones. And then, you know, Costco will have some, and there are some others, but, you know, it's a Walmart, Lowe's, Home Depot world. They, they are the drivers. And, um, and you had mentioned that they'll use it as a loss leader, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so you saw the, the Black Friday thing. Um, yeah, it's definitely a loss leader. So, and, and they did a study at Walmart. Um, oh, it's probably been 15 years ago where they, they kind of asked the question, do we really have to grow or sell poinsettias? Because they're really not, you know, it's kind of a pain for them to have a plant. They're not, they're not a live goods type of business in the winter. They have a garden center in the spring, but, you know, that's closed in the in the winter. And now you got to have a, a live good in, in the store. And it's not that, you know, there's just logistic problems. Poinsettias are cold sensitive so you know you're shipping them in michigan and minnesota you got to really protect them and and so you know it's it's a it's a bit of a pain to have poinsettias so walmart said maybe we don't have to sell poinsettias and so they did an experiment with some of their stores and their data showed that the stores that they put poinsettias in had better christmas sales than the stores they didn't put poinsettias in and 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 so their conclusion was poinsettias are our harbinger of of the christmas season so when we are decorating and getting ready for Christmas, we need to have poinsettias in there at that start of that season because it is a signal that we have made a seasonal change and you are okay to start ship shopping for Christmas. And so, which is good for growers because they're, they're putting them in the stores. And I, like I said, growers, most of them will tell you, we don't make any money off of a poinsettia. Um, we're happy to break even. Um, and there, and so you'd, you might ask the question, well, why would you bother to grow them? Uh, and the reason is you've got this greenhouse. What else are you going to do with it at Christmas? There are no other Christmas flowers to choose from. In the spring, we've got a bunch of stuff we can grow and we can sell the heck out of the spring sales. You know, people landscape, landscape, landscape with flowers. That's great. Great business. Make a lot of money. Summer's okay. We kind of get through the summer and then you've got, you know, basically August through December. What are you going to put in your greenhouse? It's going to be empty. If it's empty, what do I do with my employees? I've got, you know, 100, 500 people. I got to do something. I can't lay them all off. I got to, they got to keep them busy. And so, well, they grow poinsettias. And, uh, and so you pay some bills, pay your overhead, keep people employed, and get back to the next spring season where you're going to make some more money. But in the meantime, you know, you're, you're happy to, you know, break even. The, um, how, how would you describe, I mean, you, you covered it, but can you kind of re-describe, like, if, I, I assume your, your parents are not, uh, PhDs in horticulture, like, are they more layman? <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, so, my, so, well, so, my... so, so is it the genetics from the rootstock of plant A are going into plant B, which is grafted onto no. it, or or is no. you... you know, genetics implies that you know it's in the DNA code, right? That the DNA of that plant is doing something, right? And when you do a sexual cross, that's where you're mixing the DNA of the mother and the father, and and if you have a DNA, a genetic characteristic, like let's say, let's say big bracts are a characteristic. And so you try to get that gene from the mother into the father um, and you cross, you know, 
you you have sex between the mother and the father flowers this the offspring some of them are going to have the big brac gene some of them are not right there will always be a proportion of the offspring that have blue eyes brown eyes big brac some genetic characteristic what we have with free branching is is nothing that's in the dna code it's a living organism it's a bacterium that doesn't naturally grow in a poinsettia but has somehow gotten into there and done something that confers a beneficial trait at least in terms of the commercial production and and so and and what's interesting with phytoplasmas which are the, these bacterium they cannot be cultured outside of the plant so you would think you know you could if you identify a bacteria that did something good to a plant well you grow the bacteria in a petri dish and then you spray it on the plant and then you confer a trait you know you do something well these bacteria they lack a, a cell wall so they don't survive outside of the plant and so you can't culture them so the only place they live is in plant tissue and in the sap of the plant in particular that's the only place they live so somehow you have to transfer the sap of one plant into the sap of another plant and we can do that by grafting you can insects can do it um, grafting can do it um, there are some uh, uh, parasitic weeds like daughter, daughter is a parasitic weed. It actually feeds on a plant and then it twines around and then feeds on another plant. And so this phytoplasma can go from uh, one plant to another because they've both been infected by a, a parasitic weed. Um, so, so that's what I'm saying, it's not a genetic, it's not in the DNA code. It's in the, uh, the it's a biological, it's a totally separate biological organism that somehow, uh, changes the branching habit of the plant and we do know in plants we can manipulate branching somewhat by manipulating the hormone content in the plant just like people have hormones plants have hormones and those hormones affect the way the plant grows so if you increase the concentration of some hormones you're going to get more branching um and so, and we can spray hormones on plants, and and uh, and sometimes we do do that to improve branching of some plants, um, but it doesn't work as well as the the phytoplasmas. Is there another plant where this same phenomena has been noticed in the same way that mines were blown with the with no, the no? It is. Uh, that's what makes it you unique. Is no other plant. And in fact, people have taken these phytoplasmas and tried to put them in other plants um, to improve branching um, unsuccessfully. Um, well, well, not not just improve. It seems like that's what they do in poinsettia. But do they do something totally different? And like, like I, I think you mentioned that, that they're typically a pathogenic yep. phenomena. Yep. But are there other crops where like when one type is grafted to another of the same crop that some cool expression happens that we actually want well yeah i mean we graft plants for that there's some benefit um i mean we'll graft tomatoes and cucumbers and some uh fruit trees are frequently grafted um and there are different reasons of doing that but in none of those cases is it because you're transferring something biological from one to the other um, so for example, um, we graft, um, uh, watermelons is, is a fairly commonly grafted plant. Um, watermelons are very susceptible to root pathogens, diseases in the soil that kill the plant because it infect, they infect the root system. Well, we have root, we have pathogen resistant root stock. I mean, we have pathogen resistant watermelons that are not very good watermelons and so how do we get that pathogen resistance into a good watermelon well we we take that resistant type of watermelon and we use roots of it because those roots are going to be resistant to that soil borne pathogen and we graft a good tasting nice producing watermelon onto that root resistant uh, pathogen resistant rootstock and so now we get all the good part of the good plant 
above ground and all the good part of the good plant below ground because we've done this graft. And so we've inferred disease resistance um, by using two plants, um, which is easier than trying to breed that resistant into a good tasting watermelon. You just graft the two together. So we do the same thing with tomatoes. Um, you know, sometimes in fruit trees, we're grafting dwarfism. So, you know, you don't want a fruit tree. It gets hard to collect the fruit if the plant is a fruit tree that gets 20 feet tall. You might want a more dwarf growing fruit tree. And so you can take the really nice growing apple and graft it onto dwarf rootstock. And then that plant, the, the shoot does not grow so tall. So now you have a 10 foot tall tree, not a 20 foot tall tree because you've grafted it. Um, uh, we graft peaches in South Carolina. I guess probably all peaches in South Carolina are grafted because we have a soil borne pathogen um, that, uh, uh, well, it's, they're nematodes, little microscopic worms that, that damage the, the peach root system. So we have nematode resistant um, uh, peach rootstock. And then you take the varieties that produce really nice peaches but are not resistant to nematodes and you graft them onto these guys. And, uh, and now you can have you know, good tasting fruit and nematode resistant rootstock. So, so we use grafting on a lot, you know, a lot of horticultural plants, but n not for this reason, not, not to, for some organism to be transferred from the rootstock to the shoot because, and, and to prove that, <clears throat> like if you take the, uh, the tomato example or, you know, watermelon example, you have resistant rootstock, non-resistant -resi shoot, the shoot produces good fruit. If you take a cutting off of that tomato, and you root it and grow it, it's not going to be disease resistant. You need the, so the disease resistance from the resistant rootstock is not transferred to the shoot. So, you know, I take a cutting from the shoot and I all of a sudden have the roots from that shoot are not disease resistant, if that makes sense. Whereas with poinsettia, once you've grafted it once, you have actually moved the beneficial thing into the above ground tissue. And so that above ground tissue, you can propagate cuttings forever and it's always gonna still have that phytoplasma living in the sap of the plant. Yeah, and that, that's what I was getting at with the question, which is that, that phytoplasma triggering something that we find beneficial happening. It seems like the poinsettia yeah. is kind of the only plant you've really seen only it one. in. Um, yep. All right. So, are you are you ready for a tough question? <laughs> These haven't been tough. <laughs> all right. You are wearing a Steelers hat with the number thirty three on it in Steelers oh, yeah. history. Don't say anything yet. There were some notable players who wore the number thirty three: Charlie Seabright, Jerry Shipke, Harvey Clayton, Frenchy Fuqua, Bam Morris. Merrill Hodge, Frenchie Fuqua, and Trey Edmonds. Which number 33 are you representing with that hat? Well, that's not why it's on the hat. Ah. But Frenchie Fuqua, Frenchie Fuqua was my guy. It was, you know, 1970s, Frenchie Fuqua would wear fur coats, and he had a pair of shoes with glass uh, heels in them, like those, uh, you know, like a... Uh, yeah, big heel. And he had goldfish in the shoes. Like they were living in the heel of his shoe. So he, he was like this this fantastic dresser. And uh, yeah, so Frenchie Fuqua was the guy. Um, and uh, but the 33 is the uh, uh, the year of the founding of the Steelers, I believe, 1933. That's why it's on there. But that was an impressive list. I like Merle Hodge too, though. And Bam uh, Morris was quite the player. Although he, you know, he got kicked out of the NFL for, or kicked off the Steelers for smoking marijuana. Okay, here we go. A visual. Can you see that? Uh, 
I'll see if I Not can yet. find an, another picture of him. But that that is an epic. He he was a he had a goblet with his pimp juice. <laughs> yeah, right. there there he is. That's Frenchy Fuqua with the heeled heeled boots with goldfish. I don't know, you can't see the goldfish, but. Yeah, wow, that, that's actually on Google. That's the only good picture. I'm surprised. I, I would think there'd be more pictures of that. But that's amazing. Well, I'm, uh, I'm cognizant of your time. I think everybody, I think I speak for everybody when I say that was amazing. And uh, can, can you give us a little teaser? So w would next Wednesday around the same time, 8 a, uh, that'd be 11 a.m. your time work? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so I'll, I'll see if that works for Allison as well. Uh, do you want to kind of just give a teaser of, of what you got? This is like the cliffhanger, like end of this week's episode, people getting excited for next week. So what are you guys going to talk about next week? Well, we're going to talk about photoperiodism, which is, you know, how plants tell time. Uh, and, uh, and, and of course, this is, this is the mechanism we use to trigger flowering. And so, you know, plants use this mechanism in nature to, uh, to know what time of year it is so they can say, okay, this is the right time for us to have flowers so that we get pollination or whatever. Um, and so we'll, we'll, sh we've done experimentation um, looking at how to, uh, how cannabis responds to photo period. Um, and we've done this because with the, historically the indoor growing growers have basically used an 18 hour day and a 12 hour day. And, uh, we, we wanted to ask the question, well, what happens between 18 and 12? Certainly something interesting must, I don't, or, and, and then the other question is, are those really the one the photo periods we should be using? They certainly work, but are they the best? Um, uh, should we really be using uh, eleven and seventeen or thirteen and eighteen? Um, so, uh, so that, that that I guess that's the uh, the teaser. You see. And and we're, we haven't I would say we haven't fully uh, answered the questions ourselves, but we have we have some pretty good uh, data. Um, that we'll share with you, and and so it's it's still work that is in progress, um, but we'll we'll show you where we're at and understanding how uh, how to manipulate photo period, um, and uh, yeah, some of the aspects around manipulating photo period of cannabis plants. You you've been on the FCP, and your phone is now blowing up. You're you're famous. You're cannabis famous. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. Uh, just my, my very last thing is it, it was interesting because it seems like with the poinsettia, it's not just photoperiodism that dictates when it starts to do what it does, but also you mentioned heat as another. Is that a second factor in the poinsettia? Um, yeah, I would say heat, heat isn't like a trigger. It, it modifies the response. So, you know, if, if, the, if the temperatures are optimal, um, um, you know the the um, the 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 signal the photoperiodic signal is stronger, um, but so so I guess you'd say temperature modulates the photoperiod response, um, and so you you kind of have to do both of them. You have to have the right temperature and photoperiod. But photoperiod is the trigger. This it's the temperature is the dial. You know to modulate it uh, better. Or, you know it, it affects the rate at which the photoperiod signal works. So you can cause you know if the plants flower go from uh when you start uh the flowering phase the 12 hour nights um uh it takes eight weeks we can actually you know we can manipulate that with temperature so we can make it seven weeks eight weeks nine weeks ten weeks with temperature but you still have to have the photo period signal um, right and we've, we've done experiments through that. We'll probably talk about that are interesting where you do what's called cyclic lighting, where instead of just turning the lamps on for 18 hours, um, you could turn them on for 12 hours and then have some pulses of light in the dark period um, and you would get the same response. Um, so it's a way to save energy if, if there was a, a desire to do that. 
Got it. All right. Well, uh, hopefully we will be back on next Wednesday at uh, 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, so we originally actually had another show right after you with, um, uh, I don't know if you know who Scott McElroy is from Auburn University, but he was going to talk about Nikolai Vavilov, uh, from the, uh, Soviet era, uh, uh, grains and cereal crops and kind of, uh, this guy's place in history, but he is sick today. So we're going to try to punt that to next week as well. Um, and I did have, uh, I was trying to get a surprise guest on with you to say a quick hello, but it didn't happen. But uh, maybe that surprise guest will come on next week. Okay. Look forward to that. <laughs> and with that, uh, to everybody watching, thanks for watching. And uh, let me just look at our quick calendar here. Today is, oh my God, there's a Chad Westport uh, show tonight at, uh, 7 p.m. Pacific, 9, uh, 10 p.m. Eastern with the ranch selections. So see you all then and uh, maybe in between. So with that, I will kill the transmission. <laughs>